Hey there, welcome back to our live streaming coverage of Produced by 2014. This is day two at Warner Brothers Studios, and I am lucky to be here with Leslie Chilcott, an independent filmmaker, uh, producer, director, a documentarian, and also the chair of the PGA Documentary Committee here on the West Coast, I know. So uh, thank you for being a part of it. Thank you. It's great to be here. All right. Now, you, you just, uh, you're just just coming off the, the VOD Blessing or Curse panel. We, we spoke to, uh, to Melanie Miller and to John Sloss before, so it's nice that we're getting a, a multifaceted view of a, of a multifaceted topic, really. Could you, yeah. how, how did that panel go? We were just talking about how, uh, how people are trying to get over the information deficit in yeah. VOD. Yeah. And, and how, how are producers tackling that problem? It's an interesting question because in, increasingly, in an increasingly data-driven society, there's still not a lot of transparency with video on demand numbers. Like we were just talking about how great iTunes can be for an independent filmmaker, but when, when you chart, like when you're in the top 10 and you're number eight, you don't know if that means you did $1,000 or if 10 people saw it or 500, right. and it changes hourly, right? right? So it's very hard to keep up. And the panel was really lively because there's a lot of independent filmmakers out there that are like, there's day before date, day and date, day after date. What what's what's IVOD and subscription VOD, right. and it's very confusing. So, we have all of these tools at our hand, but box office still remains the only one you can get the next day. Right. It, like it takes some searching and some waiting and some patience to get these other numbers, and, and it's really hard to try and make a decision on what's best for your film. It's funny that the that the numbers for what we would think of really as the analog mode of distribution are the ones you can get immediately, yeah. and the ones that are digital Old are the school. ones that that you, you can't get immediately. It seems to run counter to what we'd expect in in the digital age. Yeah, and it depends on what you do too. It's like I did a little film last year, a very short ten minute film. And we were the number one video on YouTube for a day, which mm -hmm. has, has never happened to me before. And I know within a two-week period that 20 million people saw it. And I know where in the film they stopped watching, which is <laughs> something I would have rather not known. <laughs> right? So I spent six months on that project. And I spent three years making Waiting for Superman. Right. And I wouldn't change that for the world. But the data that was available to me for this, show, this shorter coding film, of, it was trying to get kids more interested in computer coding. It was right. called Code Stars. Mm -hmm. The data that was available available to me for that was just astounding. I couldn't believe it. Right. <laughs> so, what are some of the uh, what are some of the schools of thought around VOD in terms of their obviously there are a bunch of competing models, but which models are likely to work best for which kinds of films or which kind of filmmakers? Do documentarians have a, a different uh, orientation towards the space than, uh, say, a narrative feature might? The the difference, you know, it's funny because I asked questions like that mm -hmm. today and I couldn't get a, a, a consensus because <laughs> everyone has their own opinions but with documentaries I think there are even greater opportunities because a lot you might have a really obscure subject that you're making a documentary about and if you go digital it, you know it might be something that so many people are going to want to download on a Sunday afternoon or a Friday night but they won't actually go to see you know your obscure documentary about teapots or whatever right. it is <laughs> but there might be this huge following that that wants to digitally see it over the weekend so I think for documentary filmmakers and for narrative, there are many more opportunities. But with narrative, you run into, well, what do the actors think? And, and mm -hmm. uh, all of the talent and the actors, agents and managers. And are they going to promote something that's direct to video? Or how right. is it all going to work? So there, there's opportunities in both areas. But I think, especially with Vimeo and other new players coming onto the market, for documentaries, there's more opportunities than there used to be. Now, obviously, it's it almost seems like a fool's errand to speculate what's coming in, in the future, since there's so much right now that we don't know, but what's coming down the pike? What what are you looking to see other than hopefully just some clarity and people coming out with with numbers so we have a sense of direction to go? But what's there's a lot of people that are um, John Sloss, for example, uh -huh. at Synetic, and he was just here. Did yes. he talk to you about multi-screen gross? Uh, no, he so did not. He, so he's yeah. been emphasizing something that a number that's not just box office, then DVD, or then VOD. It's combining your digital and your box office, and that's your multi-screen gross. So they actually publish this on their website. So I think he's Synetic hoping. Does, yeah, yeah okay. I think he's ho Film Buff does rather. Okay. I think he's hoping that. Um, people will follow that model. And what's happening is, like Melanie's company, is Gravitas is mm -hmm. about to release some numbers on, on one of their titles. Mm -hmm. And I think as we move forward, more and more people will do it. So I th it's, it's definitely uh, a, a time of upheaval. 
Now, in terms of the uh, the difficulty in getting numbers, is it a matter of filmmakers not, not wanting to share their numbers, or is it a matter of distributors and, and VOD platforms being reticent about sharing what they say will will license a given film for, or what they will look to to uh, provide to a producer as compensation for licensing a product? I, I think it's both. I think in the past, a lot of producers didn't want to say what their films cost. Right. You no, know, that's, this, that's still, yeah, I tell because you, there's a judgment. Yeah, you know, yeah. there's a judgment that goes with it. A lot of documentaries, for example, example, don't, don't publish what it costs because mm -hmm. if if you did it for 38000 then it's like, oh, they did it for thirty eight nobody was paid. Right. <laughs> you know, if your documentary cost a million, it's like, oh, that cost a lot, you know, <laughs> right. when really yeah. it's not a lot of money. For so real. I know that a lot of filmmakers aren't incentivized to provide the numbers. And distributors aren't, you know, in, in their defense, if they need to be defended, it's actually hard for them quickly to get the numbers from all the different sources as well. That's fair enough, yeah. So um, I think we have to come up with a way that that, that makes it e easier, whether it's some sort of barcode or whatever right. it is, so that it all feeds into, you know, it has to go beyond what Rentrack is doing and all feed into somewhere. Well, well I hope uh, the person who's going to invent that was in the audience of your panel today. That would I, be I nice. hope so, too. <laughs> so I, don't, I can't let you go without talking a little bit about the Producers Guild uh, Documentary Committee, which you've been so instrumental towards. What, what are you looking to do in terms of promoting documentaries to both the Guild members and the industry? industry at large uh, as the chair of the committee. I'm coming up on my one year almost, mm -hmm. I think, uh, as uh, as the West Coast chair. And my main goal in in taking this on was to actually show the the rest of the world that documentaries aren't just downer docs, you right. know? <laughs> so when we decided to have this doc club, the first 3 that we screened were all sports related docs. Hmm. And it was something, you know, especially coming from me, someone who does make issue oriented films to just so three sports related docs. It was a little bit unexpected. Right. Then we did only female directed and now we're doing wacky crazy docs. Hmm. And 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 we will show political docs and issue oriented docs as well and we have so far, but it was mainly to try and help educate, which is always a dangerous thing the market to know that documentaries can be every bit as exciting as narrative and sometimes even more so because you're I was just talking to someone now that we should rename documentaries docu stories hmm. to take this the, right. the stigma away and it's a story it just happens to be nonfiction yeah. so that was that's our big goal is to sort of spread the word and, and the secondary goal sorry to, oh, no, no, to keep talking no but in a, in a community such as LA where we're so spread out the, a lot of the doc community, they don't know each other, or they do, but it's like, am I going to drive from Silver Lake to Venice, where right. <laughs> uh, like there's a ton of documentary filmmakers in Sil Silver Lake right. and Venice and other places, but it was to provide a place where people can go. We have a salon right. afterwards, so if you're a PGA member, uh, you can come to the documentary, we all go to the bar afterwards, and continue <laughs> to talk about the film. So it's 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 creating a nice little community, and hopefully um, even more people will start coming. All right, I hope so too. We, I know the uh, reception among the, the membership has been, like, Particle fever, people I know have been, people have been talking about that, that screen huh? for uh, like months afterwards. People are still talking about like what an incredible film that was. Well, and I'm glad you brought that up because that's a documentary about particle physics. Yeah. You know, normally you would think, why would people want to go see this? But their marketing was really good and it's a fantastic, you know, they're looking for the God particle. Right. So <laughs> that ended up being our probably one of our best attended. We, Kyle's so amazing. Um, she didn't right. expect. We, we put it out there and then she went to cap off the list mm -hmm. and uh, we had already exceeded the list that I had to call the theater and beg to put us in a larger theater because people had signed up so fast for it. So well, that's, that's a nice that problem lucky. to have. Yeah, yeah, yeah right. no, that was lucky. It was a great film. Yeah. Well, Leslie, thank you so much for joining us. Thanks for being a part of the conference and, and a part of the Guild for all, all you do for us. Uh, it's, it, it means a lot. And, Thanks, Chris. Uh, and uh, enjoy the rest of your... Who, who are you looking forward to seeing this afternoon? I unfortunately am leaving because my husband just had surgery. Very oh. minor. All is good, okay, but good I said I'm going to be home by two o'clock. Don't you worry. Okay. Well, geez, don't let don't let us keep you here. My goodness. <laughs> <laughs> so no, go go home and, and be lot. with your family. Thank you, Leslie, and and I'm sure we'll we'll see you around the guild at the next uh, doc club. Cool. Thank you. All right.